Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Oriental Hall at the Tahrir campus, the American University in Cairo. On behalf of AUC, President Anderson, the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, uh, I am honored and tremendously pleased to be able to uh, welcome you here on the 51st Tahrir Dialogue, which started immediately after the revolution in 2011. <clears throat> As has been the case uh, since we started, we've attempted to engage the public in a serious dialogue of things of importance to the public domain, issues that are important to uh, not only the school, but yes, of course, the school and the university, but the issues that we think are important to you uh, in the public um, because that's a very important element of being a policy school as well as uh, part of the mission of AUC since it was established over 90 years ago. This evening we are honored and uh, frankly, uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. This morning we've had the International Advisory Board of the school uh, meeting. We've had members from Egypt and members from outside of Egypt with us uh, talking about how best to uh, guide the School of Global Affairs uh, and ensure that it continues to produce uh, uh, programs and uh, uh, contribute to building a better Egypt and building a better region. Uh, learning from what's happening abroad and also engaging and uh, in the, in the uh, debate about what's happening abroad and in teaching and training young leaders who will engage uh, in world affairs in whether they are, sorry, in world affairs and in domestic affairs uh, in any discipline uh, that they choose. What we attempt to do is to teach and train them in the skills that are necessary to engage in the development of policy. I won't speak about the school. Uh, many of you know what we do, and it's on the website, and I've spoken about the school several times before. But let me simply say that this evening, what we've done is, because we have several members on the board who live abroad, but at the same time are either of Arab origin, and actually all three of these are, uh, but or have an interest in uh, AUC and in the School of Global Affairs, uh, we've asked them to come and talk to us about how they see the Middle East, the present, and the potential for the future. In other words, from their perspective, in the disciplines that are of interest to them, and from the locations in which they are presently situated. We think this is an important discussion to have, whether it is on politics, on social issues, or on econo economics. I think it's important because we ultimately live in a global community. We can't live in isolation. We are affected by what people do abroad and what and how they think about us. So uh, rather than simply cover it through the news, which is important, we wanted to bring to you three individuals very distinguished in their fields, very serious about their opinions. All three of them have a very strong inclination to have opinions, so this is going to be an interesting uh, uh, set of comments. Um, the first speaker, Adel Laban, is the group chief executive officer and managing director of the Ahli United Bank in Bahrain. He has, pre he has served in a number of banking and finance uh, positions in the past on the Bahraini Stock Exchange, at the Bahraini Bankers Society, at the Egyptian General Authority for Investment and Free Zones, and he has been, as well as a number of uh, banks, uh, very distinguished and large banks in America. I think he started his career uh, in New York, if I'm not mistaken, working with Morgan Stanley. Uh, and he has been awarded a number of awards uh, for the contributions he's made in this area. He received the Euro Money's Outstanding Contribution to Financial Services Award and uh, the Banker Middle East Lifetime Achievement Award. Most importantly, he is an AUC graduate, both undergraduate and with his MA, so we're proud to hear from one of our alumni, and I'm sure you're going to uh, find his talk quite interesting. Adel will be talking about political Islam, 
and oil. I leave the floor. You can speak here from whatever you want. <clears throat> Well, good evening. Thank you, Nabil, for the introduction. Uh, I have to say I come here as really an AUCN. Uh, my professional qualifications are not uh, really the subject matter of, of what we're going to be discussing, and I'm going to express personal views unrelated to my corporate affiliations. Uh, I'm also Egyptian and Arab, not by origin, but by nationality and continuing nationality, and proud to be so. I'd like to start by saying that standing in this hall brings back a lot of memories, memories that go back 30, 35 years. Uh, I'm quite used to being in the audience, gaining knowledge from presentations, lectures, that have always characterized the educational lifestyle and system within uh, AUC. But I'd like to start with a quotation, not from this hall, but from the bigger hall next door, the Ewart Hall. It's a quotation that really extols the value of knowledge and encourages to gain more reverence in knowledge. It's above the stage. Next time you go into the hall, please look above the stage. It is a very, very apt quotation. And the reason I say that is because as we look at the Middle East today, we have a very troubled and a very murky state of affairs. Any claim to knowledge, clarity, or certainty is really more akin to crystal ball gazing or to a flight of fantasy or personal hubris. Long-standing traditional preconceptions that we've had have been proven for the most part to be very, very flawed. The mold of the post-1916 Sykes-Pico agreement, or more correctly, the Asia Minor agreement that created many states in the current Middle East has been broken and probably irreversibly broken. And we say this on the eve of its centennial. It's going to be 100 years old next May, almost to the day. The replacement order that will come out is still evolving. It has not yet emerged, and I do not pretend to know what the parameters or framework of that order will be, or more importantly, what the implications will be for my country, Egypt. As a banker, my professional compass and DNA are naturally gravitating towards major continuing factors or themes which define risk levels and by implication, the ability or lack thereof to develop opportunities for progress and growth or to avoid pitfalls that could result in deterioration and loss of momentum. In my assessment today, three such forces dominate the current Middle East landscape and will have very far-reaching, sustainable impacts on the region as a whole and on Egypt. These forces are political Islam, oil, and Iran. All are cross-border interrelated themes, which often generate very emotive reactions lacking really sufficient rational assessment of their nature, their root causes, and their future implications. Given time constraints, I will focus on the first two issues, which are political Islam and oil, and hopefully we may have the chance at some point in the future to discuss Iran and its implications. 
Now, political Islam is probably the most emotive of the issues involved. People have very strong views regarding religion, regarding the role of religion in society, whether there should be such a role, whether the role should be large, should be small, should be all-encompassing, or should be very limited. I think the starting point in discussing the theme should really be definitional. What do I mean by political Islam as I speak? I do not mean what Western media and governments tend to usually use in their presentations of political Islam, which are the more flamboyant, radicalized, fringe elements who, to be fair, never cease to amaze us by their barbarity and distance from the true essence of the religion. In that scope, political Islam is effectively equivalent to Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Daesh, ISIS, or any similar permutation. I also do not believe that the definition of political Islam is the one used by regional regimes that see political Islam as any organized force seeking to acquire political authority and power in a given country. In that definition, political Islam is equal to the Muslim Brotherhood or any similar organization that has the same road goals. The political Islam that I want to put forward to you is a much broader, much more complex phenomenon that has really over the past decades penetrated all the layers of society and people across Arab and Muslim countries. Its adherents, knowingly or unknowingly, essentially believe that religious teachings should play, indeed must play, a greater role in the political, legal, and social fabric of society. They also believe that it should, that should play a role in the economic functioning of the society. Very minor, as in the imposition of specific dress codes, and we've seen incidents of that for and against in Egypt recently, to quite draconian, like attempts to resurrect a caliphate to save Darul Islam, the House of Islam, the Islamic nation, from its current problems and endemic failures, which is what ISIS Daesh claims to be trying to do in northern Iraq and Syria. If we accept that what has evolved over the past 30, 40 years, effectively, if I want to take a watershed event for regional developments, after the 1967 war. The 1967 war marked the death of secular Arab socialist ideologies in the Middle East and left the room open for other ideologies to emerge and to acquire support. Since that time, changes in the educational system, over political support by governments which have cultivated such groups, media penetration, and the general disillusionment and absence of any viable secular alternative has enabled political Islam to gain ground and to enjoy a very significant and growing presence across Arab and Muslim societies, including Egypt. This cannot be ignored or sidelined in my view. It's also interesting to note and that is a point rarely raised, that the policies used by political Islam, or more specifically, organized groups within political Islam, to provide social services to support the poor and the needy have resonated very well within populations that have a lot of poor and a lot of needy. And it's very much aligned with where I see the economic compass of societies in the larger population, lower income, Arab and Muslim states, to essentially being some form of left, left off center orientation. 
essentially a social democratic format of society without being verbalized specifically is where I think the hearts and minds of the majority of the people today stand. That is a personal view, not a scientific conclusion uh, that I put forward to you. And Egypt, needless to say, is a case in point in that. Very simply put, let me use the following analogy. The modern Arab or Muslim world and its current state of affairs cannot and would not accept the emergence of a new Kemal Ataturk, the ultimate secular ruler of a Muslim state, nor would they even accept a Habib Burqiba, the very liberal Tunisian version uh, of become a hybrid uh, secular Islamic mode of doing business. The pendulum has swung too far in another direction for that to be a viable option. So what's the logical conclusion? Yani, I'm not into, I'm not a, an academic, I'm not a political science. What's the practical implication of this? I think the practical impl implementation is very simple. If you have a stable growing segment of society present that you cannot sideline and ignore, you have to find a way to integrate and mobilize. Because if you do not integrate and mobilize, we are back to the old cycle of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and onwards of treating the issue in a security political context and that ultimately neither achieves the problem of breaking the back of the movement, because as I said, we're not discussing Al-Qaeda or the Muslim Brotherhood. We're discussing general, consensual, white-held views regarding the role of religion in society, which in my view have become entrenched. The ultra-secularist, those that are completely against this, and I would imagine there must be some in the audience today. Uh, in my view, by having absolute complete opposition to what I'm trying to put on the table, are acting in a way identical to radical takfiri fundamentalists on the other side of the spectrum. Because by completely not accepting a middle position existing, you're delaying any form of compromise, and by delaying compromise, you're creating friction and conflict. Friction and conflict are not good for business, not good for the economy, not good for the livelihood of, the st of any state, Egypt or other. Now, I fully appreciate that this view is, or could be, controversial, or not to the liking of my respected audience, but I believe policy decisions and assessments have to be based at looking at all possible options from the ex one end of the extreme to the other end of the extreme. And on the basis of the different advantages and disadvantages of any proposal, the correct policy would hopefully be adopted by any government. Now, I say this, and just to be on the record and very clear on this, that, that seems quite apt, yani, at, uh, g given what uh, I don't know if the protocol is to wait until it's through or, or uh, I, 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 I say this, and I'm not uh, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, nor their spokesman. I am not and never had any intentions of joining Al-Qaeda or uh, Taliban, but at the same time, I am a practicing Muslim, and I believe that religion within the Islamic context should play a role in managing of our affairs in life. And certain countries that have realized this conclusion are actually quite ahead of Egypt in terms of arriving at the equilibrium that enables us to move forward. Morocco is the best example of that. Malaysia is another example of that. Tunisia, to a lesser degree, is an example of that because I think the current state of affairs is really a compromise 
driven very much by the fate of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that led to the compromise emerging in Tunisia. Now, other than I don't want divisive forces, if I can avoid it, in society, are there any benefits to political Islam? I think there are key benefits to political Islam. I think there is a very large moral and ethical vacuum in society. Everybody's complaining about manners and ethics and behaviors of people across. Now, how will society improve on that? How will virtues like integrity, honesty, a belief in hard work, a belief in knowledge, a belief in tolerance actually be spread again? You hope your educational system will do that. They have not really been doing a very good, good job of it, uh, present company uh, accepted, of course, uh, in terms of spreading that. Family units are supposed to do that, but then the family units in many ways are affected by the economic and social circumstances surrounding them. So that as a force, and if you take the political content out and more just focus on the basic ethical messages involved, uh, it's similar to, let's say, the puritanical uh, forms of uh, the Protestant movement at its beginning when it essentially tried to instill the uh, virtues of hard work, honesty, and integrity. And those societies that actually adopted that ended up doing better than the Catholic societies that did not have the same set of virtues as entrenched. Now, uh, I think we can only achieve this progress and eliminate divisions by one key change in approach and management of the uh, process of dealing with political Islam. We tend to focus ad nauseum. Actually, it is boring, and I think academia is, is, is very guilty of that. We keep regurgitating and, 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 and focusing attention on literature of Ibn Taymiyyah, which, by the way, is not completely accurate in terms of what is said, of Abu al-A'la al-Mawdudi, who is the spiritual uh, mentor of, of uh, Sayyid Qub, and he was essentially trying to address the situation of Muslims in India, and to Sayyid Qub himself, or on the literature of some equally extreme Shia equivalents to radical Muslim thinking. And we completely forget that within the religion itself, over its evolution of many centuries, there were both practitioners and proponents of a very different, centrist, modernized, constructive form of political Islam. The names are self-evident. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the really the key builder, the second uh, ca caliph and the real builder of the Islamic State. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph, the man who said, if poverty was a man, I would kill it. There cannot be a clearer uh, statement on economic justice than that. That is, 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 a, is a simple expression. Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari. This is really the ideological father of Al-Azhar, the institute in Egypt that has existed for a thousand years. A man who started as a Mu'tazala, a complete rationalist in terms of Islamic thought, and gradually gravitated over his life to a centrist, more balanced approach. And his legacy is really what governs Al-Azhar, not the four different sects of the religion, and now the Sunni version of the religion. Then Imam al-Shafi, the, the humanist, really, in the four uh, imams of, uh, of the Sunni sect. And more recently, Gamal al-Din al-Afghani, the, the Afghan Shiite who came to Egypt. And I underline Shiite, not Sunni. He came to Egypt, and he, he saw Egypt as a hub for developing a reformist trend within Islam. And his great disciple, Imam Muhammad Abdu, and his followers, who sadly never actually took control over al-Azhar to do the change in religious thought that is needed to be done.
from the paper that the dean has just given me, I have my doubts whether we will discuss oil or not, but the point in, uh, in, uh, in political Islam, I hope it's, is clear. Uh, from a very pragmatic perspective, I think it should be looked at as a force to be harnessed for good rather than an enemy to be crushed at any cost. If I switch to oil, I would like to use a very well-known Middle Eastern and Egyptian cliche that you always see in the official media. That is, we are at a, between inverted commas, historic crossroads. Our countries are always at historic crossroads, but we don't seem to be leaving the crossroad ever. With oil, for a change, we are at historic crossroads right now. Very simply put, supply and demand. We've always focused on demand and demand being driven by GDP growth, demand being uh, driven by societies catching others in terms of consumption patterns require more energy to be burnt. Now we have a paradigm shift on the supply side. What has happened in terms of fracking and horizontal drilling and equally importantly, what has happened in terms of data analysis and field management has brought in a lot of reservoirs that could not be tapped to produce oil and gas to be producing. So the number of countries that are producing oil and gas are growing, and the number of companies, we're no longer in the age of the shells and the BPs and the totals. There are new companies operating in the shale space, which is the new space of the industry, that are quite large in size. Three implications for that. First of all, free fall in gas prices, followed by a free fall in oil prices. They plummeted about 50% from their highs. And they're not expected to recover more probably than 50 or 60% of, of their previous highs. So welcome to the age of 50 to $60 barrels per day. And I think one of my esteemed panelists may argue that I'm being wildly optimistic on that and the uh, prices will be much lower. But even 50-60, all the Gulf governments and the oil producing governments, non-Gulf, have reacted to the Arab Spring. What have they done? They've extended massive economic incentives in terms of services, in terms of payments and subsidies to citizens that has increased the break-even price to balance their budgets. So their budgets today need to balance anywhere from 80 to 110 dollars. Some are even higher than that. Oil at 50, 60, that's not enough revenue unless you pump more oil. Most of them are limit up in terms of their physical capacity to pump oil. So if you break even at 80 and you're, you're selling at 50, where is the 30 going to come from? Two sources. Either they'll borrow the money internally or externally because they, most of them are under leveraged, not all of them. Some of them have considerable leverage. Or alternatively, they run down any reserves they have. So past savings that they've kept aside will eventually evaporate if this process continues. The third and final point here, and that's the least noticeable one, but probably the, the, the equally dangerous of the three, as dangerous as the other two. What are the oil majors doing? The Exxons, the Shells, the BPs of the world. These guys, if you look at their share prices and return on capital, they've actually been declining in the last three years of very high oil prices. Yani 2011, 12, 13, average Brent prices north of 110, return on capital of these companies going down. Why? Essentially, different reasons for each company, but the bottom line, very high levels of inefficiency in managing their operations, particularly development costs. You know, you have a lot of revenues coming in. People are less careful about how they spend the money. The PNL gets the hit, the, the return gets the hit on the shareholders. What are they doing? There is a concerted effort right now to be healthy, profitable, and give a good return to your shareholders at price levels around the $50. Massive slashing of course, is happening, primarily through standardizing development and exploration projects, cutting off all the fat ruthlessly within these companies, and effectively making them a lot more efficient. 
All of this, if you put it in the mix, mixer and want to come out to the conclusion, what does it say? Simply put, in the old days, the major oil companies dominated the supply. With the governments, some of them were sovereignly owned, some of them were non-sovereignly owned. Then you had the consuming uh, countries. Clearly, if I'm selling, I want a high price. If I'm consuming, I want a low price. Right now, the suppliers have increased in number, both in the sovereign and the corporate space. And my corporate suppliers, the people that are interested in PNL and in profitability, are not unhappy to have a price at 70. Actually, they'd be very happy. And my shale and oil producers, despite what Saudi Arabia is doing right now to try to force them out of business, I think this will to a large degree fail because they are the innovative edge of the industry. This is all about technology. This is all about bringing in new resources, reducing costs, developing production by using technology. This is the space of engineers. I will steal one or two minutes if the Dean does not cut off my mic to say what are the implications for the region, very simply there. The implications for the region are very clear. If you have a major producer like Saudi Arabia, and let's use that as an example, suddenly facing a drop in revenues, they have to do adjustments. The adjustments will either be internal or external. It depends on the priorities they will ascribe to these adjustments. If it's external, and it usually starts externally because you want to protect uh, the favor, uh, stay on the good side of your people, rather than keep Egyptians happy, let's keep Saudis happy. If, if you do that, then practically donations, FDIs, are going to go down. And FDIs are going to become more conditional. FDIs are foreign direct investments. They're going to come down, they're going to be conditional, and the key condition is ability of the recipient to repay or to give a return to, and it's not a handout. I want my money back, I'm willing to give you a space of time to pay me, but it's not a one-way payment. Internally, this should have a positive effect on the subsidy situation in Egypt in terms of reducing the value of the energy subsidy, but that, is a, is a tricky issue because if it lulls you into a sense of sleeping and not continuing to cut subsidies, which is extremely difficult in the current political environment, uh, effectively consumption will continue to grow for natural forces that grow consumption and will pull up the subsidy figure again, even if oil prices and gas prices remain low. The other key effect is Egypt has been overly dependent on the GCC for remittances of Egyptians living there. They export me to the Gulf. I export back some foreign currency into Egypt to help sustain what I need to spend in Egypt for my lifestyle and my family and so forth. Now, in the absence of a growing budget, the import of labor goes down or the pay of labor goes down, or the income paid per labor or per employee is squeezed because the government itself is incapable of funding uh, that. Then the final point, just to give it the political dimension for it. Today, Saudi Arabia is leading the Arab portion of the region, at least. That leadership is driven by wealth by money. In the event that this wealth starts shrinking and they are less aggressive in using it to basically deliver their foreign policy across the region, what will happen to leadership within the region? Will it slide into a complete vacuum? Will it be contested? Or are we simply inviting external powers to re-establish their authority within the region? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Adel. It was uh, very interesting and enlightening. Uh, I won't get into summaries or comments, uh, but to save time for our speakers, the next speaker, Mr. Henny Finn Dutley, uh, is the vice chairman of the Clinton Group in New York. 
He's an investment banker. He has worked on Wall Street in different firms. He worked also with the World Bank as uh, the, the chief investment officer at the bank from 75 to 86. He's a graduate of uh, MIT, uh, has a personal interest in a number of academic trends, both in the States and, uh, I may say, in China, as well as here uh, with us at GAP. I'm uh, very happy to, to have him with us here, and I look forward very much to his comments on the economies of the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, I'll sit here. Sure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Fahmi, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. This is a great honor for me to be here when Nabil uh, reached out to me a few years ago to uh, join the advisory board. Uh, I thought this was a great opportunity, uh, an Arab by background, but that did not live or work in the Arab world for most of my life. I've been in the U.S. for over 50 years. So it was a great opportunity to, uh, to uh, contribute and help out in, <coughs> in any way I can. And what I consider to be a very important institution is a center of excellence in a region that desperately needs uh, centers of excellence. So uh, the bill also said that we are very serious people. So I'm going to start out by telling you a serious story. Uh, some of you may know about an old TV program in the 1950s and 60s called I Love Lucy. Uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, who were husband and wife, both live and, and, and TV, uh, had this wonderful uh, program that now has been translated into about 80 languages and continues to run uh, for those of you young ones you may be able to see some reruns in there. Uh, there's a very um, a poignant uh, episode in which uh, Desi Arnaz comes into his house, his apartment, opens the door, and he sees uh, Lucy on all fours looking for something. And uh, he says to her in his Cuban-American accent, uh, Lucy, what are you looking for? And she says, I'm looking for my earrings. And she keeps on looking, and he says to her, trying to help her, did you lose the earrings in the living room here where she was? No, she said, I did not lose it in the living room. I lost it in the bedroom. But the light is much better here. So, uh, as, as an economist, as an investment banker, I, I'm always looking for the right place to look. And in the midst of this mayhem in, in the region and the confusion that's taking place over there and the violence, um, uh, I uh, have always believed in, in the link between economics and politics. And I thought, you know, my, uh, my forte and my understanding of economic things are much better. Uh, so I would not be able to comment on the political side, but I will comment um, on, on the economic side and the economic underpinning that the region has been undergoing uh, for the past uh, 10, 15 years, and maybe longer, <coughs> and where is it now, and what are the prospects of the future. And <coughs> in doing that, I sort of <coughs> uh, evoked uh, some of the images of uh, Charles Dickens' idea of uh, tale of two cities. Uh, it was the best of time and it was the worst of time. Uh, and as I reviewed the, uh, the reason for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, I thought that concept of metaphors of uh, the best of time uh, and the worst of times are very apt uh, metaphors for uh, describing uh, the people uh, and, and the, and the <coughs> situation um, in the region. Uh, you had period uh, of contradictions that occasionally gave people uh, an illusion. Uh, I believe it was an illusion of hope, but it also included periods of despair uh, as we have gone through these, uh, these cycles from time to time. Uh, so um, uh, Idol uh, gave a relatively sort of pessimistic picture in that didn't depress you, I think listening to me probably will do the job. <laughs> um, <coughs> the, uh, if, if the last 10 years have been periods of mixed hopes and, 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 uh, and pessimism, uh, I think the period ahead uh, is decidedly grimmer and probably long-lasting. Uh, <coughs> And it's long-lasting because uh, not only of the, where the situation of the region uh, is at right now, but also because as the Arab world was dealing with its own internal issues, the world has been changing. And the world has been changing at a 
rapid pace in many ways um, that uh, have changed the way uh, people work and operate and, and probably will do more so in future. There's a school of thought of which I'm a member that believes we are on the, uh, that the digital technology is, is coming to a point where its applications is broadening and widening, that we're on the verge of a second industrial revolution uh, that will change the way of life, the way uh, the industrial revolution changed that. And instead of industrial revolution this time, is more of a digi digital revolution. Uh, one of the key areas in which that uh, Mr. Leban uh, touched on, uh, that technology uh, has, uh, has evolved, uh, is that it uh, evolved in one of the key uh, sectors uh, for the Arab economy, and that is energy. And I'll touch uh, briefly on that, uh, on, that, um, uh, on that development because it's very critical. Uh, to the region. And uh, as a segue into doing that, I, I would like to remind you that the, there's a huge correlation, very close correlation, between the performance of the economies of the oil producing countries in the region and the non oil producing economies of the region. There is, by statisticians and economists' uh, jargon, about a 75% correlation between the performance of the economies of oil producers and the economies of the non-oil producers in the Arab countries. The linkages are clear, and I don't want to go into them. They happen with some leads and lags, but what happens in Saudi Arabia will ultimately impact Egypt and will ultimately impact Morocco and will ultimately impact uh, uh, other uh, countries in the region. Um, within a relatively sh short period of time. So the cycle, economic cycles are not independent, they're highly correlated. Uh, what uh, has become uh, clear to me uh, in, in looking at this, uh, at this region is that uh, probably uh, the past decade will be remembered uh, as a period of missed opportunities. It's a period of missed opportunities uh, to restructure and to uh, reposition uh, the economies of the region, not only to bring them to current uh, era, but also to prepare them for a com competition in future, uh, future times. Uh, I don't know why uh, the region did not um, uh, did not prepare itself for that, uh, for that change. I have no idea why, for example, it missed that opportunity. Uh, you know, there are theories about that, and some relate to politics, and some relate to culture, and some relate to inertia, and some relate to governance. But whatever combination of those regions, the fact is that um, it has missed that opportunity. And what happens is, uh, as you observe the, those changes, is that during times of uh, rising times, complacency sets in, and, and people just simply sit there and enjoy the, the, uh, the gusher. And during times of bi uh, bad times, paralysis sets in, and governments step back. And what's important about the fact that governments did or did not do things is that governments dominate, uh, for the most part, the economics of the region. Uh, they, they control between 40 and 60 percent, sometimes as high as 80 percent uh, of the region's economies from one country to another. Uh, and they control it across the board from uh, the management of resources, ownership of resources, uh, employment, um, uh, spending policy, the whole bit. So, uh, you know, they, they, there were some periods of good time, and they did take advantage of it in, to some extent, and there was a period of time in the past decade in which things looked uh, pretty positive. Um, money was flowing in, and it was getting sort of spread out in a in, in reasonable way. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, Bene the region sort of felt that there was some continuity of good time. As it turned out, um, as I was expected, that was very unsustainable. And now I believe that uh, uh, the, <coughs> the uh, uh, bad times are probably going to be a longer lasting and will take some time. There are some silver lining, as Mr. LeBan had mentioned, that may force the, uh, some parts of the region to, to begin to uh, look at itself and begin to depend on itself instead of outside, uh, outside help. Uh, but that, uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, is still a question mark. Uh, 
this change is also happening at a very inopportune time for the region. Uh, as more and more um, uh, Asia grows, uh, U.S. and big powers' attention is shifting and rebalancing uh, to Asia. Demographers expect that somewhere between seven, uh, seven, seven and a half billion of the world population will be residing in Asia by the two, year 2050. This is out of nine billion, nine and a half billion. Uh, and clearly, uh, trade, commerce, economics, political, uh, and other issues will be focused uh, into that area. Uh, in the last uh, you know, period, 10 years, uh, the region's economy, as I said, did very well. It actually grew by an average of about five times its average growth over the preceding 10, 30 or 40 years. So th that's the reason why I think hope and expectation of continuity uh, was, uh, was beginning to, to set in. Uh, but that also brought with it uh, a uh, complacency. Uh, government spending uh, was rising, and was rising very fast, and it accelerated right in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, particularly in the Gulf countries, but also in other countries as well. Uh, it's, it's a way of so bribing the people and giving them uh, some expectation of hope and changing attention. Uh, Saudi budget and Saudi spending has risen uh, by uh, about five times for it was in the year 2000. Uh, so uh, it, it locks them into situations where governments, um, when they give, um, they're appreciated. But when they stop giving, <laughs> the uh, dynamics uh, change quite a bit. Uh, I've estimated that uh, because of this decline in, in, in uh, oil prices in the past uh, six months or a year, uh, that the budget in the um, uh, Gulf uh, countries, GCC countries, led by Saudi Arabia, uh, will be rising to a point where it will probably be closer to about 25-30 percent of GDP. Uh, government budget uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, for this year, 2015, which started out with a deficit of $39 billion, $40 billion, approximately 20 percent of the budget. Uh, is uh, rapidly uh, approaching $150 billion, which is close to about 65-70% of, uh, of the budget spending. That is clearly unsustainable. It's not something that you can rely on. And it has implications to a number of countries that have been beneficiary uh, of, the, uh, of the Saudi and other Gulf countries' largesse, Egypt being one. Um, Morocco, Jordan, Bahrain, uh, you know, uh, other countries. So, so there's quite a bit of, of concern that there is going to be a lack of continuity in this. And these are fa fairly substantial resources. Uh, Abu Dhabi alone was giving um, Egypt last year, in 2013-2014 prices, about 15% of its entire oil revenue, uh, annual oil revenue. Uh, so. <laughs> you know, oil prices come down, the revenues come down, so the subsidies are, or, or, the, or the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the giving is smaller, but it continues to be a very large portion of their, uh, of their, uh, of their uh, revenue, and as the revenue declines and shrinks, uh, their ability to maneuver uh, so that they can give people their, their own people money and others uh, becomes more, more and more constrained. So uh, I'm going to touch very briefly on four uh, issues about the economies of the region and bring us to the present, and then the, I'll leave the, uh, what happens next uh, to questions and answers. Uh, so uh, focusing first about, uh, on the economies of the region, uh, the one thing that's very common among, among the economies of the region is uh, it's a very high, stubbornly high double-digit employment rate that ranges from an average of about 10 percent in some countries and rises to as much as about 18 to 20 percent uh, in other countries. Worse, uh, and that's true for the oil producers and as well as non-oil producers. For um, worse than that is the fact that unemployment is much higher among the youth, and because the youth represents a larger portion of, of society. Uh, you know, unemployment uh, hits the youth at a, uh, much harder than it hits the, the adults um, in, in, uh, in uh, many ways. This clearly has uh, both political and social, uh, social, uh, social uh, 
uh, problems. Other problems related to unemployment um, is, is the fact that there's a very low participation rate uh, among uh, the labor force uh, in the region. Average participation rate, uh, meaning the, the uh, uh, labor force that is working compared to the overall labor force of eligible age for work. Uh, in, uh, the, the average in, 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 uh, around the world is about uh, 60%. It's higher in some countries, it's lower in others, but the average is about 60%. The Arab world's uh, labor participation rate is 30%. For women, it's even lower. It's half the men's uh, labor participation rate. Uh, productivity of labor, uh, what do you get out of uh, uh, manpower that you're using is about half uh, international OECD average. So in the Gulf countries, for example, um, the average pay for labor, okay, the cost of hiring people uh, is about 80% uh, uh, of the labor producers. That means you're hiring people to pay them instead of um, producing something to the economy, which accounts quite a bit for the uh, poor performance of, um, of the labor force. <clears throat> there are a number of uh, other economic issues that are much more esoteric, but they have some very uh, serious bearing. And, and the most important of which, and I'll just describe it generally as a layman, um, is that the ability of the region's governments, since they are the only force that influences the economy, uh, to uh, act in bad times, to adjust the economy in bad times, the, like adjusting interest rates, adjusting money supply, adjusting fiscal deficits, adjusting taxes and what have you, is severely constrained. It's probably one of the most constrained region, save for some of the you know, basket cases in Africa and South, South Asia. So um, uh, it, it adds to a situation that uh, not only are uh, the economic um, cycles, uh